Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about a recent paper I wrote, and um, it's on the archive if you'd like to take a look. And it has the same, um, the title of the paper is the same as the title of the talk. Um, and like John said, so if you have questions at any point during the talk, feel free to interrupt. Okay, so of course, um, today I'm going to be talking about spectral gaps. So I just wanted to start by um, telling you what is a spectral gap and sort of um, one interesting way to think about it. Um, so one way I like to think about it is in the context of a heat equation. So, um, so for this first slide, you should just imagine you're in some um, situation where you have a discrete spectrum for the Laplacian. So maybe you're on a bounded domain with some reasonable boundary conditions. And so in this setting, uh, you can take your heat distribution, your solution to the heat equation, and do the usual spectral expansion of it. And um, when you do this, what you find is that um, to first order, the solution behaves like e to the minus lambda 1t times the first eigenfunction as t goes to infinity. Um, so, so after this, you can ask a slightly more refined question and ask um, what is the rate at which the profile of this heat distribution converges to the profile of the first eigenfunction as t tends to infinity. And one way to try and answer this is to um, take your heat distribution, u, and multiply it by e to the lambda 1t. So now you have something that has, um, that lives roughly on some uh, sphere in L2. It has roughly constant L2 norm. And then you can measure the distance from that to the first eigenspace. And if you take an L2 norm, what you find is that this is bounded above by a constant times e to the negative of the spectral gap times t as t goes to infinity. So this means you can interpret the spectral gap as the rate at which the um, heat profile converges to the first eigenfunction. And so since um, eigenvalues and therefore spectral gaps are difficult to calculate in general, um, we'd like to get lower bounds on the gap. And this will tell us um, a lower bound on the convergence rate. OK, and so um, in this talk, I'm going to be doing this all in the context of the roban laplacian eigenvalue problem. So the Roban eigenvalue problem is um, the usual Laplacian eigenvalue problem in the interior of some domain. And then on the boundary, you have Roban boundary conditions. So this means that the normal derivative of your eigenfunctions plus um, the Roban parameter, which is constant in this talk, times the eigenfunction itself has to equal zero on the boundary. So uh, there's some nice ways to think about like what Roban is. And one of them is that the Roban boundary condition interpolates between the two well-known boundary conditions, which are Neumann at alpha equals zero and Dirichlet, which formally is at alpha equals plus infinity. And so the way you can see that um, you get Dirichlet at plus infinity is if, well, formally, if um, you divide the boundary condition by alpha and then send alpha to infinity, you kill the normal derivative term and you're just left with uj equals zero. Okay, and so as long as you're on um, a bounded domain with say Lipschitz boundary, you have discrete spectrum and the first eigenvalue is simple. Um, so what this means is your spectral gap lambda two minus lambda one is always a positive quantity. Okay, and so um, I just wanna start by discussing some known lower bounds on the spectral gap. So there's um, two well-known theorems, one in the Neumann case, alpha equals zero, and one in the Dirichlet case, alpha equals infinity. Um, so the first is a result due to Payne and Weinberger in 1960. And it says, if uh, D is a convex domain, then the Neumann spectral gap of your convex domain is bounded from below by the spectral gap of the interval that has the same length as the diameter of the domain. And then by um, usual techniques, you can calculate that and it's pi squared over the diameter squared. 
And then much later in 2011, um, we got the analogous theorem um, thanks to Andrews and Clutterbuck for the Dear Clay case. And that says that the Dear Clay spectral gap of your convex domain D is bounded from below by the Dear Clay spectral gap of the interval of the appropriate diameter. And again, you can calculate that number. And then in both of these cases, um, you can saturate these inequalities in the limit of um, rectangular boxes that are degenerating to a line segment. So uh, something, I'm sorry about it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I don't understand the notation. What does it mean uh, lambda two minus lambda one of one and zero or I and zero? Um, yeah, so I is this interval. Yes. It's some interval that has length equal to the diameter of your domain. But like what is of uh, I and zero? And what is um, so, so is the Roban? Oh, parameter? yes. So the, the second argument is the Roban parameter. Ah, OK, that's fine. Thank you. OK, and um, I should say one other thing, which is in the Dirichlet theorem, you can also include a, a convex potential on the left, and this still works. OK, and so now um, you can ask the question, well, what about um, the Roban case for alphas strictly between 0 and infinity? And the answer is uh, we know a lot less. So when alpha is between zero and infinity, Andrews, Clutterbuck, and Hauer conjectured the made the following conjecture. So again, if you have a convex domain, then the spectral gap of your convex domain at Roban parameter alpha should be bounded below by the spectral gap of the appropriate length interval at the same Roban parameter. And um, so we know this holds for rectangular boxes because you can do some fairly explicit calculations. And again, the limits attained as the rectangular boxes degenerate to a line segment. And this was first, and this was proved by Rick Logason in 2019. And so this image below is, um, I just want to include this um, numerical calculation. So um, what I did was I, took a trapezoid in MATLAB and I calculated the eigenvalues for many values of the Roban parameter. And so if you do that, you can plot the spectral gap of the trapezoid, which is the blue curve. And you can also plot the spectral gap of the appropriately length one dimensional interval, which is the red curve. And what you see is that for each positive value of the Roban parameter, the one dimensional gap gives you a lower bound for the higher dimensional gap. Okay, and so now I wanna ask the question, could this conjecture hold for alpha negative? So does this inequality hold for convex domains when alpha is negative? And it turns out the answer is no. And so um, I prove this by uh, calculating the Roban gap along a, um, a sequence, a particular sequence of degenerating domains. And these domains are, I call them double cone domains. So in R2, um, they look like this. They're like, you can imagine two infinite cones and you kind of overlap them and take the intersection. And then in three dimensions, um, this is what it looks like. And we'll call them D theta in this talk. Okay, so, um, so for the rest of the talk, alpha is gonna be a fixed negative number and I'm gonna um, often suppress that second argument in um, the eigenvalue notation. Okay, so the theorem says if alpha is negative, then the spectral gap of the double cone domains tends to zero as um, the opening angle theta tends to zero. And moreover, um, we can do a little better in that there's a constant C such that the spectral gap of the double cone domain is bounded above by a constant time, something that's exponentially small in theta. Um, John, can you see this little toolbar thing at the bottom that's popping up? Uh, I, I can indeed see the little toolbar thing at the bottom. Sorry. You can or can't? Can. 
Okay, uh, let me try and make that go away. I think you actually did let it go away and then it reappeared immediately. Uh, yeah. I think maybe just don't touch the cursor. So now, for example, it went away. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, and so now, um, if you think about what this theorem tells you about um, possibly extending the Roban gap conjecture, well, um, we know the spectral gap of d theta can be as small as we want. So in particular, it's gonna be smaller than the spectral gap of the appropriately length interval um, for sufficiently small theta, right? And um, so I guess it's important to note here that as theta tends to zero, the diameter of this double cone domain is constant. So the, um, that interval doesn't change. And so this tells you the, the Roban gap conjecture cannot extend to negative alphas. Okay, and um, so here's an, another numerical picture, but now for the double cone domain. Um, so the, the picture is set up the same as before. So the blue curve is the spectral gap of the double cone domain and the red curve is the spectral gap of the appropriate 1D interval. And so what you find is that for positive values of alpha, the Roban gap conjecture holds. So for each value of alpha, the spectral gap of the two-dimensional domain is bounded below by the spectral gap of the interval. But then when you move to alphas that are negative, the blue curve, the two-dimensional curve dives below the, the one-dimensional curve and um, so the Roban gap conjecture doesn't hold. And um, if I were to do this, the same numerical calculation for double cone domains with even smaller values of theta, what you would find is that the point where those two curves cross would move to the right towards um, the Roban parameter alpha equals zero. Okay, um, so are there any questions at this point? Okay, then I'm gonna move on and um, tell you a heuristic for um, why you should expect the double cone domain to have small gaps in the first place. So the intuition or the heuristic comes from um, the case of the infinite cone C theta. Um, so, so the infinite cone is of course not a bounded domain, um, but when you have a negative or band parameter, it turns out you can have discrete spectrum anyway. And so there'll be a, a mix of discrete and continu continuous spectrum. And in fact, there's a, a small miracle that occurs and you can actually calculate the ground state of this thing. So the ground state is this function phi theta, which is an exponential. So clearly it's an eigenfunction of the Laplacian because it's an exponential. And the only other thing you have to do to check this is um, an eigenfunction is to calculate normal derivatives at the boundary, which is a straightforward calculation. Okay. And so the thing to notice about this ground state is that as theta tends to zero, um, the, it behaves like e to the large negative number times x. So if you L2 normalize this thing, it's going to concentrate at the vertex of the cone. And um, in two dimensions, we know even more. We know that all the eigenfunctions concentrate at the vertex as theta tends to zero. And this was done by Khalil and Pankroshkin in 2016. Um, so you might be asking yourself, why should you get this kind of concentration in the first place? And um, so a little bit of intuition is that you can think of the Roban boundary condition as um, a delta function potential of strength alpha on the boundary. And so when alpha is negative, um, you should think of this as an attractive potential, which tells you the eigenfunctions should stick to the boundary. And, um, and they, I mean, you should think about um, around the vertex, you sort of have more boundary concentrated in 
um, a small uh, a small location. So this means the eigenfunctions prefer the vertex to other locations on the boundary. Okay, so now what does this tell you about uh, the case of the double cone? So, so the heuristic um, for this slide is the eigenfunctions of the double cone should also concentrate at the vertices. So um, what you expect is that the problem on the double cone should decouple into two eigenvalue problems, one on um, each copy of the infinite cone C theta. And so you expect that the jth eigenvalue of the double cone should be approximately the jth eigenvalue of the disjoint union of two infinite cones as theta tends to zero. Okay, and so now if you run with this heuristic and ask yourself, what does this tell you about spectral gaps? Um, well, you should calculate the first two eigenvalues of the disjoint union of the double cone. And um, what you find is that the first two eigenvalues of this disjoint union are equal. And that's because you could have um, a two-dimensional space of ground states, basically. You could have the ground state on C theta and then zero on the other copy. And then you can swap these and you get linearly independent eigenfunctions. So this tells you the spectral gap of the disjoint union is zero. And if you believe the heuristic, then this tells you that the spectral gap of the double cone should tend to zero as theta tends to zero. Okay, and so the way we're gonna prove the theorem is by a trial function argument. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, make a trial function argument to show that the first two eigenvalues of the double cone can be controlled by the first eigenvalue of the infinite cone plus an exponentially small error. So since we want an upper bound on the spectral gap of the double cone, we're going to get um, an upper bound on lambda two and a lower bound on lambda one. And then when we subtract this first eigenvalue of the um, infinite cone, um, we'll cancel and we'll just be left with something, we'll, we'll just be left with an exponentially small upper bound. Okay, so um, at this point, I wanna dive into the proof a little bit and give you some idea of how it goes. Uh, so are there any questions at this point? Um. I, I would have one. So, so up until now, we're, we're talking about a very specific example where we don't, uh, where we don't see uh, uh, the, this um, gap happening. But um, does it heuristically does it seem to be, say, rare that you have a, a, a very close distance between the the eigenvalues are there, are there situations where you would expect to still observe a gap uh, with negative Hubbard parameters, or, or, or I mean, a, a quantifiably large gap, or, or does it seem to be the general idea that you always uh, get the general gaps? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, so, so I, I think um, if you were to pick, you know, a random domain in some sense. Um, then you typically expect the gap to be large. So um, part of the key here for the double cone domain is that it's symmetric. Um, and so you sort of have this, uh, um, it, like since it's symmetric, it sort of decouples into um, two problems that are identical. And then, um, you know, since the first two eigenvalues of the disjoint union of these cones are equal, this tells you that the gap should be small. And sort of the other ingredient that's happening here is that um, these angles are very small. And so you have, in some sense, you have very large curvature at those points. So uh, hopefully that gives you some idea. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm gonna um, dive into the proof a little bit. So as is usually the case with eigenvalues, um, getting upper bounds is easier than getting lower bounds. So let's start with 
um, the upper bound on lambda two of the double cone. Um, so to do this, what you're gonna do is um, you'll take phi theta, which is the ground state of the infinite cone, and then multiply it by a cutoff function. And this cutoff function is going to be one for um, x values between zero and one minus epsilon, and then it's going to die after x equals one. Okay, so then you'll take um, two copies of this um, cutoff ground state, and um, you'll transplant them with rigid motions f and g onto each vertex of the infinite cone. I mean, sorry, the double cone. And then when you do that, um, we're hoping this thing is going to be a valid trial function for uh, the second eigenvalue of the double cone. And it is because um, since d theta is symmetric, this tells you u1, which is the ground state of d theta, is also symmetric about the y-axis. And so this tells you that um, psi theta is going to be orthogonal on L2 to the first eigenfunction. And that's because um, in the definition of psi theta, I picked a minus sign here. So it's an anti-symmetric function. OK, so then um, you make the, the usual trial function argument so you know that lambda 2 of the double cone will be bounded from above by the Rayleigh quotient for the double cone evaluated on your trial function psi theta. And then since um, psi theta is um, anti-symmetric about the y-axis, you can sort of ignore one side of the double cone and then extend your trial function by 0. And so this is equal to the Rayleigh quotient of the infinite cone on the cutoff ground state. But then remember, as theta tends to 0, um, the ground state of the infinite cone is going to concentrate at the vertex. So this means all the action is happening within the support of the cutoff function up to some exponentially small error. OK, um, so now that shows the upper bound on lambda 2 that we needed. And now I want to talk about the lower bound. So the lower bound is um, more complicated, but we'll go through it slowly. OK, um, so the first thing you do is you take uh, phi and u, which are the ground states of c theta and d theta. And I dropped a couple of the subscripts there because uh, the notation just gets a little dense. And then you cook up um, this new operator, which I'll call the tau Laplacian. So you take some function tau and um, you form this differential operator. So notice that when um, tau is a constant, you just recover the usual Laplacian. And in this case, I'm going to make the particular choice of tau equals phi squared. So that's the infinite cone ground state squared. And then I'm going to make the ratio v equals the ground state of d theta divided by the ground state of c theta. And I'm going to restrict everything to be on the left half of the double cone, which I'll call t theta, this shaded part of the double cone. OK, so then um, something interesting happens. And what you find is that this function, this ratio v, is an eigenfunction of the tau Laplacian. And it has eigenvalue, which is equal to the difference of the eigenvalues of the two things in the ratio. OK, so this gives us lambda 1 of the double cone minus lambda 1 of the infinite cone. And so this is good for us because, remember, we wanted a lower bound on lambda 1 of the double cone in terms of lambda 1 of the infinite cone. So it suffices to get a lower bound on this eigenvalue mu1 and show that mu1 tends to 0 as theta tends to 0. And remember, mu1 is negative um, because this boundary parameter is negative. OK, so um, a few comments about this problem. So. Um, you might hope that as you take the limit theta tends to zero, that 
there's some kind of limiting problem and that the eigenvalues will converge to the eigenvalues of that problem or something like that. But at the moment, the limiting problem is um, kind of unclear because this is sort of a singular, singular limit. And um, so that's because our domain T theta is collapsing. So remember, um, theta is the opening angle on the vertices on the right and left of the double cone. And the boundary parameter alpha over sine theta over two, as theta tends to zero, this thing's tending to minus infinity. And your weight function tau um, is concentrating at the vertex of T theta. So our solution to this problem is going to be to do um, a few changes of variables. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to um, push out the problem on T theta to a radial problem on a circular sector or a, a spherical sector in general. And I'll tell you exactly what that means on the next slide. And then um, once you're on a spherical sector and you have a radial problem, uh, we'll argue that you can extend that problem to a whole ball and that'll um, handle the problem of the domain collapsing. And then after that, we're gonna rescale to a big ball and this will sort of um, unconcentrate our coefficient that's concentrating. Okay, so let me tell you about this um, push out map. Um, okay, so we're gonna call this push out map P and what it's gonna do is it's gonna map this truncated cone T theta to a spherical sector S theta. And this is S theta on the right here. And so um, I could write you a formula for this, but um, it's kind of just notation heavy. So, but it's easy to explain in words. So what you do is um, you look at the vertex of T theta, and then you would draw a ray emanating from the vertex. And you look at all the points along that ray that hit T theta, and you take all those points and you just stretch them linearly until you hit the curved part of um, the spherical sector S theta. And that's the map P. Okay, and then um, we're gonna cook up a new weight that I'll call sigma and it's um, tau compose the pushout map. And the key here is that when you do this, you get a radial weight. Okay, so then we can make a new eigenvalue problem out of this. So we'll have um, the sigma Laplacian instead of the tau Laplacian. And um, I don't know what the first eigenvalue is at the moment, but we're gonna relate this back to the first eigenvalue of T theta. And uh, the Roban parameter beta um, or alpha has changed slightly, but only slightly, so it doesn't matter much. Okay, so, so we need to relate the eigenvalue on the spherical sector to the eigenvalue on the truncated cone. And so we're gonna make a trial function. So remember V is the eigen function on T theta. So if we compose it with um, the push out map P, we get something in H1 of the spherical sector and we can use that as a trial function for the first eigenvalue of this problem. And the key here is that um, this push out map P is approximately the identity and its Jacobian matrix is also approximately the identity. And the way to see this is as theta tends to zero, the right face of the boundary of T theta is getting very close to the curve boundary of um, S theta. And so the push out map P only has to stretch these um, rays just a little bit. Okay, and so um, you can make the usual trial function argument. And um, so you have to take derivatives of V compose P and make some changes of variables. But what you find is that this is smaller than um, a constant that's approximately one times the Rayleigh quotient of T theta on the eigenfunction. So you just get the eigenvalue of T theta back. Okay, and um, I'd like to mention that this map P was first used to analyze um, Dirichlet eigenvalues in two dimensions of thin triangles. And this was 
to my knowledge, this was first done by Pedro Freitas in 2007. And so in this case, what he did was um, he pushed out the triangle to a, a circular sector. And at that point, he could do Bessel functions and things like that to calculate eigenvalues. OK, so now, um, uh, now we have this problem on a, a spherical sector. And what we're going to do is we're going to extend it to a ball. So remember, um, we have Neumann boundary conditions on sigma theta, this part of the boundary. And the weight's radial. So this means we can extend the problem um, to the whole ball. And then we're going to do this um, plain old rescaling. So now instead of a ball of radius one, we'll be on a ball, a big ball of radius theta th to the minus one. And then you do um, this sort of change of variables. So if um, so remember W was the eigenfunction of the problem on the spherical sector, and then say W tilde is the extended one. So if you take that and you divide it by e to the minus alpha r, um, which you should think of as coming from uh, the, the weight coefficient in the previous problem, then what you find is that um, phi satisfies a Schrodinger eigenvalue problem. And so I think the way to think about this is what we've done is we've taken the coefficients in the sigma Laplacian and we've sort of pushed all of them into a potential. And it turns out the potential is something very nice, right? It's, it's basically the Coulomb potential from physics. It's one over R. I, I, I'm sorry, Derek, but why is it so clear that the, the Neumann conditions mean that it's extendable to, I mean, I see it if, if the angle is a uh, integer fraction of, of two pi, but I, uh, why does it always hold? All uh, right. So, um, uh, so here it's it's important to remember um, we're dealing with the ground state of this problem, so it's um, so it's a positive function, and you're not going to get like oscillations in the radial direction. Okay. Yeah. So um, so I think it's maybe it's um, a little easier to see if you think about the problem on the ball first, and then what happens if you restrict to um, a spherical sector. That might make. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. OK. Um, right, so now we have uh, this Schrodinger eigenvalue problem. And the key is that the potential is fixed. It doesn't depend on theta. And um, the only theta dependence um, well, there's, there's some theta dependence in this boundary parameter, but um, it's tending to a Neumann problem. So you shouldn't be too concerned with that. So the, the main part of the theta dependence is in the domain. And so all that's happening is you're on a ball and the ball is tending to infinity and you have a fixed potential. So this should lead you to think about um, the first eigenvalue of this Schrodinger operator on all of Rn. And so you can calculate this, and thankfully it turns out to be zero. And so um, what you expect is that nu one, the first eigenvalue of this Schrodinger problem on the ball, should converge to the first eigenvalue on the whole space. So it should converge to zero as theta tends to zero. And so um, uh, I had various ideas about how to prove this, but um, it turns out uh, what I came up with was to try and use special functions. So remember, um, this Schrodinger operator is basically uh, the Schrodinger operator with a Coulomb potential, which is the Schrodinger operator corresponding to the hydrogen atom from physics. And so um, we know how to pro solve that problem exactly. And when you're on the ball, it's just slightly more complicated. Well, maybe not slightly, but it's more complicated. So, um, so the ground state of this Schrodinger operator with eigenvalue e has the form some special function times 
e to the minus square root of e times r. And remember, we're on the ball. And so this special function is called a confluent hypergeometric function. So if you're familiar with um, the hydrogen atom from physics, then um, this should remind you of a, a little bit of those eigenfunctions, where in the full space case, um, this special function is replaced by a Lauger polynomial. So I guess um, in some way, maybe you can think of the confluent hypergeometric function as like approximating the Lauger polynomials in some sense. Okay, so then um, you wanna know, I mean, we have a formula for the eigenfunctions. So you'd like to write a formula for the eigenvalues. And it turns out the eigenvalues E are given by um, solutions of some transcendental equation involving the confluent hypergeometric function. So the way you should think about this is um, probably the same way you think about um, how you write down what the eigenvalues of the disk are from the Bessel functions, right? You write down what the eigenfunctions are, and then you ask, um, what is the eigen, uh, what is the boundary condition tell you about the eigenvalues? So that's exactly what happens here. Um, so I'm not going to write the transcendental equation down because it's just kind of big and gross, and I don't think it would um, help any. Um, yeah. So then, what you do is you look at your transcendental equation, and you realize. Um, since this special function m comes from some ODE with polynomial coefficients, you can do the, the usual thing and um, write a nice power series for it. And the coefficients in the power series are some combinatorial objects. Um, so if you get good enough estimates on the coefficients of that power series, you can use the intermediate value theorem on the transcendental equation to get very sharp estimates on um, what the roots of it are. And after unraveling all of that, this tells you that um, the first eigenvalue of the Schrodinger operator is bounded from below by an exponentially small constant. And then if you go back a couple slides, you find that um, this is good enough to get you a lower bound on lambda one of d theta minus lambda one of c theta. <clears throat> and that's exactly what we wanted to do. So now if you combine this with the upper bound on lambda two of the double cone and you form the gap, you get this exponentially small upper bound that I talked about before from the theorem. And so that's the proof of the theorem. Um, are there any questions at this point? After this, I would just like to leave you with a couple open problems and yeah. Okay, so if not, then um, I'll move on to some open problems. Okay, so remember, um, so the Roban gap conjecture was stated for alpha between zero and infinity, and it says you get a lower bound on um, the Roban gap in terms of a one dimensional gap. Um, and we, we just showed that this doesn't work for negative alphas, but you could ask the question, um, um, do we know anything for negative alphas about this problem? And it turns out we do. So in 2019, Rick Loggison proved that for alpha, for any alpha you want, positive or negative, um, among rectangles, the gap inequality holds. Um, so this sort of um, leaves you wondering, like, is there a natural class of, like, subclass of convex domains? where the Roban gap conjecture holds for all values of alpha. I'm not sure whether this question has um, sort of a, a neat answer or not, um, but I think it's, it's somewhat interesting to think about. And so there's um, one other result of this flavor, which was proved by Mark Ashbaugh and me. And so it's in the context of one dimensional Schrodinger operators. So now, um, if your eigenvalues are lambda j of v and alpha, where v is a potential and alpha is your Roban parameter, um, then the theorem says if v is a symmetric single well potential, so symmetric means even with respect to the 
center of the interval. And single well means that the potential, as you move from left to right across the interval, the potential is first decreasing, then increasing. So for this potentials of this type, we know that um, the gap of the Schrodinger operator with potential V and Roban parameter alpha is always bounded below by the spectral gap of um, the operator with no potential and Roban parameter alpha. And this works for any Roban parameter you want, positive or negative. Okay, and um, so a couple more open problems in um, this one dimensional context. So, um, so again, you're looking at one dimensional Schrodinger operators on an interval with Roban conditions. And then the open problem says, um, if V is convex or it's single well with center transition point, then you have the usual gap inequality. And this should hold for any alphas you want. Um, so let me just explain what a single well potential with center transition point is. So single well means again, that as you move from left to right across the interval, the potential is first decreasing, then increasing. And center transition point means that um, the point where the potential trans, um, transitions from decreasing to increasing happens at the center point of the interval. Okay, so we know that this is true um, for convex V when the Roban parameter is bigger than minus one over the length of the interval. And this was shown by Andrews, Clutterbuck and Hauer in 2020. And we also know it for potentials that are single well with center transition point for positive Roban parameters. And this was done by Mark Ashbaugh and myself in 2020. But for alphas below those ranges, we don't know if this is true or not. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Thank you uh, very much uh, for this uh, for this talk. Uh, we now have time for uh, questions. If you have any, you can either ask them directly or uh, ask them in chat. Aaron. Hi, John. Yes, Michael. Michael. Yeah. Uh, I want to make a conjecture which someone can disprove immediately and then solve all the problems. Uh, would it be possible that for every fixed negative alpha, there exists a minimal value of an angle, say, suppose you consider polygons, then for all angles greater than this minimal angle, conjecture still holds, and this critical angle depends on alpha. One can do numerics just to check whether it's true or not to start with. Um, yeah, so, so my feeling is something like that is um, probably true. Um, but so like you said, th this angle is going to um, depend on the Roban parameter, I think. Yeah, this angle would depend on the Roban parameter and to sort of, it will be, the critical angle will be zero for alpha greater than zero, but then it will grow as alpha decreases to minus infinity, so. Yeah, well, um, okay, so um, maybe I should be a little more careful. Okay, so I've actually thought about this a little bit. Um, so, so if you take one of these double cone domains um, mm -hmm. that I've been using, um, I, I think you can do something um, that that sort of makes all the these two angles small. So if you if you cut off the two angles, the the two vertices on the end, and you cut off like an epsilon size piece from each side, um, then I think domains like that can actually still have small gap. I'm not 100% sure about that. I wrote a little bit about that in the paper, mm -hmm. um, but I, I think by some approximation argument, you you might be able to show those things have small gap. Yeah, I would just consider conjecture it off the top of my head. It does not have to be true. Yeah. Sorry, may I ask something? I do not know how to 
yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I was a uh, uh, so so go, go ahead. Uh, Ah, okay, yeah, just, I mean, yeah, but first, I mean, uh, just, uh, just a reaction to Michael's question, but in fact, it has nothing to do with angles. I mean, if you just take a smooth domain and you make it small in one dimension, then you can yeah. show that it's uh, somehow, it's, uh, you have a kind of uh, tunneling effect. It's enough, it has nothing to do with corners. I mean, here, mm -hmm. it's just mm -hmm. corners mm -hmm. make, it, make it computable. But uh, just, but I have a question just because I just, maybe I missed the point and maybe it was explained it. Uh, but uh, can you compare, in fact, uh, just the balls with the intervals? Uh, just does it call, does the conjecture hold just for balls? As you're asking, do we know the conjecture is true for balls? Yeah, but just I mean, can you compare the spectral Robin spectral gap for balls with a Robin with a spectral gap for intervals? Uh, just to, to make it simple. Um. Uh, because I think if you will need a good uh, class of domains, and I mean the class of balls, it's a, it's a good one to start with. I would, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine um, that is true for all alphas that the gap of the ball is bigger than the gap of the interval. Okay. Yeah, but anyway, I mean, just I mean, uh, here in the last questions, so, I mean, in the last series, you always uh, mention these single well potentials, but what you consider. Double cone, it's certainly not an analog of a single well potential. It's a double well potential because it's a, because your tips are clearly wells. I mean, I mean, just take it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I see what you're saying. Uh, yeah, so I'm, um, yeah, so the, the study of like single well potentials and, and gaps. Um, uh, it, it's been studied quite a bit before, so it was sort of natural to ask if, if those results expen extend to Roban and if they extend to the case of negative alphas. Um, but yeah, so I guess the point is that um, in higher dimensions, um, even though you have convexity of the domain, you can still have, I mean, in some sense, it's, it's kind of a, a double well potential, right? Yeah, but I mean, as soon as you have, uh, let's say, a uh, kind of symmetry, it's you, you expect the exponential. Uh, I mean, the exponential split is exponentially small splitting. Yeah, but anyway, it's, it's really would be curious to just to to have a look at just at, uh, at the balls because I mean it's uh, because my because I mean it's just because if it doesn't hold for the balls, I think you have no there is no hope to. Uh, that it holds in, a, in, a, in a, any other class of domains. Uh, right. So I would say so my personal feeling is uh, like that. And okay, okay thank you. Yeah, thank you, Constantine. Uh, Before going on to the next question, there is a comment by Chris Judge saying that the uh, idea of approximating thin triangles is uh, actually much older than, than 2006. There are papers by Barry and Wilkinson, diabolical points of the spectrum of triangles, and Lisa Gerson, asymptotics of the first nodal line of the convex domain, and probably others that uh, have been doing this uh, approximation of triangles by, uh, 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 by uh, uh, spherical centers uh, before 2006. Um, I mean, that's a, it was just a, a comment uh, there in chat. Uh, for the next question, I will go to uh, Bernard Elfa. Yes, uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, we hear you well. Yes, so uh, I have a few remarks. So uh, with uh, Konstantin Pankraschkin, we have analyzed the case where when theta is fixed and alpha tends to minus infinity. Mm -hmm. And then in this case, we have uh, the equivalent of lambda two minus lambda one. We, in another paper, I think it's with Eman Kashmar, maybe with Nicolas Raymond also, we, we have the case of also of the ellipse, well, where we look to alpha tends to minus infinity. And again, we see uh, a splitting, an exponentially small uh, splitting. So uh, of course, uh, so it's in 2D. Uh, of course, it's not exactly the same problem, but with respect to the conjecture, uh, 
maybe it gives some uh, some light uh, on this. And the last point is that uh, in for uh, if we just want an upper bound, so uh, usually it's enough to have Agmon, the so-called Agmon estimate on the decay of the eigenfunction uh, relative to each corner. Uh, does it? And this this is not uh, this is a rather universal way of uh, uh, obtaining uh, exponentially smaller uh, upper bound for the splitting. And uh, maybe it works also for fix alpha and theta tends to, to zero. So that's the remarks. Uh, can you comment or? Um, yeah, so, um, so I, I'm familiar with um, some of the work you mentioned about alpha tending to negative infinity. Um, but so I guess one concern I had was, so. Um, so I think what you're saying is um, maybe you could take, you know, some sequence of domains and do some kind of rescaling and sort of put no, things I in the. I don't claim this. I don't know, but uh, okay. I just uh, I just mentioned that for fixed domain, you you get uh, as alpha tends to minus infinity, you you get very precise results, and uh, in, with respect to the initial questions. That, uh, the initial conjectures, uh, does it give some light about these conjectures? Maybe it says that always for alpha uh, sufficiently negative, it cannot be true or something like that, no? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 if, if I may uh, say, I, I, as alpha goes to minus infinity, what does the gap for the interval look like? The, does it also get, do, does lambda two minus lambda one of the, of the interval goes to uh, zero exponentially fast as alpha goes to minus infinity. I, I mean, I don't know. It, uh, yeah, it gets small. It's known, yes. Uh, yeah, 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 but I mean, so with regards to the conjecture, the, to the case you're talking about with the ellipse or the, it, it, it's not clear whether it contradicts uh, this Robin gap uh, conjecture. Yes, I, I don't remember the reference, but I, I suppose for the interval, uh, the same problem, uh, one can get the equivalent. Uh, so maybe, um, yes, it's a first question to, to look at, to compare the, the, the two asymptotics. All right. Um, uh, so there's a question in the yeah, chat. Yeah, yeah, I was, uh, I mean, this is the, the next question now is in chat. Thank you, Bernard, for your question. Uh, is from Enea Parini who asks, um, are there some results concerning upper bounds for lambda two minus lambda one for negative alpha? Um, yeah, so I, I think the answer is to that is, you know, if you have a, a diameter normalization, um, then you probably don't expect upper bounds. And, um, the intuition for that um, um, comes from the infinite cone again, I think. So in that paper by Khalil and Pankroshkin that I mentioned. Um, so they compute asymptotics for um, all the eigenvalues of the infinite cone in two dimensions. And if you think about what the gap does as um, the angle gets small, then um, the gap actually tends to infinity. So then, um, you know, what you should do for like a domain of diameter one is maybe you should take um, a circular sector or a triangle or something and do the same thing. And you, you can see that the gap blows up, I think. All right, so that seems to answer uh, any other question. Does anybody ha else have any other uh, question for uh, Derek? Right, well, I mean, it seems that uh, your, your, your talk did get the uh, conversation going uh, uh, today. So thank you again for, uh, for your talk, uh, and for everybody who had uh, questions today. Um, we will reconvene as usual next week uh, with a talk by uh, Yannick Seyer, who will talk to us about 
uh, eigenfunctions and cluster estimates for Schrodinger operators on manifolds. So thank you all for being here today and see you all next week. Thank you.